It doesn't have to be super dark. Can you guys see it? Super dark? You're going to fall asleep. No? All right. Um, so this is probably going to be a very different talk than the kinds of talks you're used to, um, in that I'm not going to be talking about mapping or something traditionally geologic, although I consider my research to fall within the geosciences um, or the earth system sciences more broadly. Um, so, as I'm talking, if you don't understand something, just feel free to jump in, okay? If I say something that you're like, wait, what is that? Um, so, I'm going to talk today about expert novice differences in geologic field mapping and related cognition. And the related cognition, I'm going to talk specifically about a spatial visualization skill. So, how many of you have ever heard someone say geologists are good spatial visualizers? Or, okay. Um, and I'm going to talk about the extent to which that is true the extent to which that matters when you're performing a complex task like mapping, okay? And I think what this kind of research can do is it can give us some understanding of how we might teach our students differently, how we might reflect upon what we do differently. Um, I think my research is unique in that I like to compare experts to novices. A lot of times people make assumptions about experts. Geologists are good spatial visualizers. I challenge you to find a paper in the literature that shows that. Um, so why would I focus on experts? Well, we know that experts and novices are different, right? So we know that experts have better working memory capacity than novices. So if any of you have ever heard of these famous chess studies, that these famous studies have been done in chess with chess masters and then chess novices. They show chess masters and these novices um, real chessboard configurations, take them away and, said, and ask people what they saw. The experts are able to reproduce what they saw much more easily and better than the novices. And that's because it's something familiar to them. And so they're not seeing a chessboard with pieces on it. They're seeing the Markov move. Right? So I bet most of us in this room, when we see a block diagram of an anticline, you know immediately what that is and you could reproduce it because you know what that is. A novice has a much harder time doing that. Um, Experts also do have better spatial visualization skill. There's lots of studies with artists and architects and organic chemists that show that people in those fields that are spatial have better visualization skills. And what's a visualization skill? That's your ability in your mind to rotate an object in space or fold it or bend it or break it and twist it and then see what it would look like after those actions or retrodict that, do it in the reverse. Experts who are in these fields that are somewhat spatial have better skills than the general public. Experts are also much more fluid in their problem solving, and I'm sure we've all seen this, right? So there's a problem that someone's faced with. They have to figure out what subsurface structure looks like. And if you're an expert at it, you might attack the problem in different ways until you can get to a solution. And students will often say, I tried it the one way I know how to try it. I don't know what to do now. And they have a hard time figuring out how to be fluid in their problem solving. Um, okay, so there are differences between experts and novices, and I think that these expert-novice differences can inform us about how ultimately to train people in the discipline. So, as I said, I'm going to focus on visuospatial ability. So, again, that ability to rotate, bend, twist, and see in your mind what that would look like. And I'll show you some examples. So in the geosciences, I started doing this work because I was actually telling this story. Many years ago, I was at a professional meeting, and people in my field were giving talks, and they were saying, we have studied students, and we've looked at their visual spatial skills, and wow, the students in our classes aren't very good at rotating and bending objects in their minds. It's a skill you need. We're going to teach them to improve that skill. And my question was, well, how do you know experts are good at this? Maybe experts aren't good at this, and somehow they figured out a way to do these tasks without having this underlying skill. Oh no, we know experts are good at this. But I couldn't actually find anybody who'd done that research. And so there's lots of assumptions about how geoscientists think and learn, but a lot of it's based on our own anecdotal evidence and our own impressions, and not necessarily research. <clears throat> so I have three questions I'm gonna walk us through. Um, I'm gonna be here. The first question is, is there a relationship between that visual ability and expertise in the geosciences? Does that relationship exist? The second question is, does it matter for a complex skill like mapping? Are people who are better visual spatial people, are they better at mapping? That's actually an assumption that the field has made. And then finally, 
other than Vidra's spatial ability, is there something different about what expert mappers are doing in the field, good mappers are doing in the field, experts, than people who are novices at mapping, who are new to the field? Does that make sense what I'm going to do? You intrigued and excited? Yeah. You're a very quiet crowd. Okay. Um, I want to orient you to what I'm talking about. Okay. So, what is expertise? Have you guys ever heard of 10,000 hours of deliberate practice? Who's heard of that? Okay. So, the amount of time that you spend in the field, not in the outside field, but in a discipline, that determines, to some people, that says whether or not you're an expert. And some people, Erickson has argued that if you have 10,000 hours of deliberate practice, you become an expert in the field. That's true, probably, for these simpler fields, disciplines, like chess playing or piano playing, okay? Geological sciences is a much more complex domain, and so that may be that amount of time in the field might fall apart. You're an expert in some parts of the discipline, but it's a very complex discipline. Um, you can also measure expertise, but the more time you have in the field, I've been a geologist for one year, I've been a geologist for 15 years, the person with 15 years experience is more expert. You can also estimate expertise by looking at status. Student, uh, undergraduate student, graduate student, assistant professor, full professor, emeritus, right? So that status probably relates something to expertise. Um, peer consensus is a good one if you're a GSA fellow or an AGU fellow or a AAAS fellow. You have some thing that your community has said, you are elevated in our minds, you are an expert. Um, so those are sort of these, um, they're not anecdotal, but they're these um, non-direct ways of measuring someone's expertise. And then you can also measure expertise. You can give someone a test of their knowledge. So um, the ABET in engineering is a test of knowledge, right? And you can also measure someone's skill, take them outside, take a strike and dip. You know whether or not they're an expert at taking strike and dip, right? Okay, so there's different ways to measure expertise. When I talk about expertise today, I'm gonna to be talking about one of these, and if it's important, I'll explain which one, okay? Here's the tests I'm gonna talk about for visuospatial memory, or um, ability. How many of you have ever seen tests like this? Oh, a bunch, some of you, okay. I'm going to start off by saying I cannot do these tests. So I can now because I know the answers, but um, I actually am a field geologist with low spatial abilities, which I think is one of the reasons I find this research interesting because I'm okay in the field. I had funding to do field geology. I did field geology. I didn't make maps, but I did other things in the field. It worked out fine. I took advanced structure. I passed it, right? Um, so these are three examples of spatial abilities tests, which we used in this research. So in the first one, is it this thing? Oh, in the first one, in this test, you have to fit some or all of these objects into this shape, and you have to say which ones will fit, okay? In this test, the paper folding test, which is super classic, you are shown how a piece of paper is folded, and then one or more holes is punched into it, and then you're asked when you unfold it, which one of these whole configurations is what it would look like. And then this third one is a space relations test. You have an unfolded uh, 3D object. You fold it up. Which one of these folded up objects is that object folded? These are all timed. So it turns out, if you give people these tests, they're actually quite doable if you have time, right? You can work around it. So for instance, before I knew what the answers were, and really, I think I've trained how to do these, I would take a piece of paper and fold it and punch a hole in it and unfold it and get my answer, right? Other people can look at it and know the answer, right? Um, so these three get at a measure of your ability to fold and unfold objects in your mind, your ability to rotate objects in your mind with this one, and your ability to do both of those things with this one, because these are folded and rotated. Bear, you're with me? Okay, so spatial visualization. The better you do, do on these, the higher spatial ability. Okay, so let's look at this first question, which is a simple question. Does spatial visualization ability correlate to expertise in the geosciences? How many people would say yes? Just say it. Yes. How many people would say no? And how many people would go, I don't know, tell me. You're an I don't know, tell me. Okay, so but there was sort of a resounding yes. Okay, so let's see to what extent that's true. I'm actually going to show you some data I've never bothered publishing, but I probably should. Okay, so the hypothesis would be with that yes, right, that 
Um, visual spatial ability and expertise should correlate in this linear fashion. People with low expertise should have low ability. People with high expertise will have high ability. Now, that's not going to be perfectly true, right? Because there's going to be some people who aren't geoscientists who have high spatial ability, right? Um, but you would certainly expect high, people with high expertise to have high ability based on that hypothesis, okay? So let's see if that's true. So I'm going to show you two studies that I did to answer this question. Um, in both of these studies, participants completed these two tests. One of the studies was a computer-based study where I had people complete a test on a computer in my laboratory or I went to their place of work. Um, the other test, how many of you go to GSA? Anybody ever seen my booth? Oh, come to my booth. So I do a research booth every year at GSA. I run out of space. I pass out candy bars because y'all do anything for Snickers when you're tired at the meeting, right? And you fill out a survey for 10 or 15 minutes. And in this way, we actually timed people at the booth. I had this undergrad who had like four stopwatches going. It was pretty awesome. And we timed people taking these tests. Okay? So I'm going to show you the results of these two studies, all right? two different groups. And I can't combine them because psychologically it's two different treatments. Okay? So um, in the first study on the computer, I had 39 people who volunteered for the study. Um, I paid them $20, I think, to participate because they did this and some other tasks as well. They were um, actually half women, half men, just about. Uh, majority Caucasian, and they were 27. They were in their 20, late 20s, early 30s, mostly. There were some people much older and some people much younger. Um, and these people ranged from non-scientists, so they were not scientists at all, all the way through people who were professional mappers for the State Geological Survey. You guys with me? OK. So this is the data. I'm going to explain what you're looking at. So on this axis is spatial ability. You can get a negative score for spatial ability because the number, the way it's calculated is you count up how many they got right. And if they marked an answer, you subtract off the ones they got wrong. If you leave a question blank, you don't lose any points. But some people lost a lot of points because everything they marked was wrong. Um, that's the y-axis. The x-axis is expertise. And the expertise measure, I don't need to explain, but this is actually a combination of time in the discipline, your rank, and, and actually a measure of how many courses you've had in the field. Okay? And so this measure of expertise just separates people who really haven't had any, any geoscience all the way through people who are pretty uber expert. Okay? And then the spatial ability tests, um, it turns out I can average the scores on these two to get that measure. So what do I see? I see that there's this very low correlation, an R squared of 0.08. It's not nothing to psychologists, but it's pretty close to nothing. It feels like nothing between expertise and spatial ability. As you gain expertise, there's a slight increase, right, in spatial ability. Now, there's a wrinkle, though. And the wrinkle is, anybody know what the wrinkle is for spatial ability measures? Like what other variables might impact it? Age impacts it. So after, it depends on who you talk to, but after about 30, you lose it. And what else impacts spatial ability? Chocolate. Chocolate. <laughs> gender. Actually, gender impacts it. So men tend to do a tiny bit better than women, just a tiny bit. So you have to account for gender, all right? So it turns out that in our expertise pool, they were all men. So we're not going to see really if gender matters. But we have, for some of our non-scientists, we have, or lower expertise, we have women. So you have to account for gender. You also have to account for age. And not surprisingly, as you move up in exp expertise, you also move up in age, right? So expertise increases, and then the people who are blue are over 30, where expertise starts to fall away, or, or spatial ability starts to fall off. It's OK. By the end of this, you won't feel bad if you're over 30. Um, OK, so how do I account for that? This is where a statistical test comes in, which I hope you guys feel OK with. So what I did was, this is a standard thing. Um, I did a regression to predict spatial ability. So I wanted to see to what extent does gender, age, and expertise level predict spatial ability. How much can I explain variation in spatial ability by variation in gender, by variation in age, and by variations in expertise? Okay. And what I found was for this smaller study that you can actually account for about 12% of the variance in spatial ability. 
psychologically, that's a lot, okay? So I can account for 12% of the variation by accounting for gender and age and expertise. But it turns out in this study, age and expertise didn't actually seem to make much difference. It really was mostly gender that, that was significant and explained this variation. So I know from this study that gender is significant. It's a small sample. Gender is significant. Expertise is suggestive it might matter, but I'm not sure yet. So you have to do a larger study. Okay? So then I went to a professional meeting, and I collected more data. With me? Okay. And um, these are my lab helpers, these people right here. Um, and I collected the same two spatial abilities tests. And we had um, people that were undergraduate majors all the way through professionals. And there were a couple of people who didn't have any geoscience expertise. A vendor came and got a candy bar and filled out a survey. But they were almost all undergraduates through professionals. And generally, the undergraduates were juniors and seniors. They were advanced. They had quite a bit of geoscience. Okay, And that includes graduate students as well. OK, so what do we find? It looks kind of similar, right? So we see there's, as expertise increases, spatial ability, maybe it increases a tiny bit. It almost looks like there's no relationship. But don't forget, we have to account for differences in gender. So maybe there's some signal in there. Can't really see it visually. And we have to account for differences in age. Some of our novices are older, which is nice. And um, some of our budding experts are younger. And then, of course, really expert people are going to be over 30. Yeah. That's right, there were no negative scores. So that's the first clue. The first clue is geoscientists are doing better than the general public. And actually, we know this. I can look at the absolute scores, and I can say geoscientists do a little bit better than the average person. So do architects and artists and landscape planners, et cetera. Any field that's somewhat visual tend to do better. Uh, bus drivers. So now we do a linear regression, and this is what we find. It's pretty cool. In this case, gender oops, is not significant. And, and uh, it's, it basically, it's not significant. It doesn't really explain much of the variance in the model. So in, in, for this population of geoscientists, gender seems to fall away as a variable that matters. Well, I think that's pretty cool as a woman. That means that, great, women and men are on equal footing. When it comes, once they're in the geosciences at least, once it comes to their spatial ability, they're on equal footing. That's pretty cool. And then what I find is about 14% of the variance in spatial ability is explained by age and, about, and then expertise, where expertise explains about 10% of the variation. So if we go back, 10% of the variation in this data, which is like all over the place, is actually, once you account for age and gender, is actually explained by expertise. So what would you conclude from that? Yeah. Expert geoscientists have slightly higher spatial visualization than novices. There are two possible explanations. Either we're selecting for people so that the better your spatial ability, the more likely you are to be successful in the field. That's one possibility. You're born with it. Or you practice the skill and you train a little bit, and you become better. And we, people argue all over the place. It's not, I think it's both, to be honest. We get 1,000 people at the booth every year. So it's about a sixth of the attendees at GSA. And we do not tell them what survey they're going to get until they say, I will do a survey, and then we give them one. So we actually have one where we had 10 different surveys. So this was a small subset of people. So it was random of the 1,000 people who came to the booth. It was a random 80 with a tiny, um, like there was a couple of people who were like, I'm not doing this test. Okay. So it's not random. In fact, there's no such thing in this kind of research because you can't really get those people. So. But it's about, it's about as close as you can get. Does that sound good? So experts have slightly higher visual spatial ability, and you have to account for gender and age. This is not rocket science, but I always like to test the assumption. I don't, like, I'm a little picky. I don't like to say, yes, we assume it, so it's true. OK, so that first study says, yes, experts have slightly higher skill. Great, expert geoscientists. 
The second question is, does it matter for complex geologic skills for which people would argue it does matter? So mapping, people would say, is a highly visual skill. Is that true? Yeah? OK. Does it matter is the question. So if it matters, we would expect as visual spatial ability increases, people become better mappers. They have better mapping expertise. OK, so we'll see if that's true. So this was a really cool study. Uh, colleagues and I had an NSF grant. And we took 70 geologists out into the 69 geologists out into the field. Two people were dropped out of the data set because we had missing data. Um, but we took a bunch of geologists out to Montana. Uh, over two field seasons, and we had them make a map, and we put GPS units on them, and they wandered around the field area, and we have tracks of where they went. I'll show you that data in a little bit. Um, and at the beginning of the study, we had to take a whole bunch of cognitive tests, about 25 different tests, to measure their general intelligence, their spatial ability, their underlying geoscience knowledge, et cetera. I'm going to show you just a subset of the data to look at the relationship between uh, visuospatial ability and mapping. Okay? That was a really fun study. And you guys probably know what this is. Maybe? You're trying to figure it out? Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, if you do know where this is, <laughs> if you do know where this is, any of the maps you see are actually distorted because we promised we wouldn't show or publish the actual map because this area is still being used for students. So if you, if you see a distorted map, that's why. Okay. So in this study, we had actually three measures of expertise. In the other study, I just had two. In this study, we had three measures, sorry, of spatial visualization. You could average these together to get their visualization ability. And then we had two measures of expertise. One is a knowledge measure, the geoscience concept inventory. It's a set of fundamental questions. And you can actually measure someone's expertise using this instrument. And then also skill. How much did a map that people made mirror an actual known, very well thought out map. Um, and I'm going to say that we walked the boundaries of these contacts with a GPS unit. We knew exactly where those boundaries were. And we could compare the accuracy of the real geology to the accuracy of people's maps. Okay, So we could get an actua accuracy estimate. So knowledge and skill as measures of expertise. OK, just to remind you, oops, just to remind you, you can use these to measure expertise, but I'm going to use these two in this study. Okay? Knowledge and skill. All right. So, this is the data. And it looks, people are like, where's the data? What? Okay. Like, so this is, this is the way in the experimental psychology literature, this is how you plot this data. It's two points and there's a line. You take, I know, right? I know! So you take your population, you split them in half. And you look to see, you take people who are the lower half of visual ability, and then you take people who have the higher half of visual ability, and you look to see how that, those, those groups differ across some measure of, of something, in this case, expertise. I know, right? It's two points. Um, so in this case, if our hypothesis was, if our hypothesis was that as visual spatial ability goes up, um, expertise goes up, so should visual spatial ability. What we see in this case is that, in fact, as your score on this measure of your knowledge in geology goes up, your visual spatial ability goes up. And there's a relationship that says that 18% of the variance in visual spatial ability is explained by knowledge. As you become more expert in the geosciences, you have more visual spatial ability. Okay. Now I want to know about mapping, right? I want to know if there's a relationship between how accurate your map was and how strong your visual abilities are. And this is what we find. It's a really tiny relationship. As mapping accuracy increases, visual spatial ability increases a tiny, tiny bit. Just a little. It's like 8% of the variance. It really doesn't explain a ton. It explains something, but not a ton. Visual spatial ability isn't highly related to mapping. But. What if we said, well, OK, what if these two things intersect, interact with each other? Maybe there are some people who are new to the geosciences or newish who have lower knowledge scores, but they're just good mappers. They're just good at it. 
And maybe there's some people who have high geoscience scores. They're just bad mappers. They're bad at it. How do these two variables intersect with each other? This is fascinating because this is what we found. What we found is that those people who have low knowledge scores, these are our advanced undergraduates and our um, early level graduate students, their mapping accuracy increases dramatically with increasing spatial ability. So for novice mappers, for people who are relatively new to mapping, visual spatial ability gives them a giant leg up. Does that make sense? Okay. So your students coming in, those with high visual ability, they're going to be better mappers than the ones who come in with low visual ability. What I find fascinating is this. For your experts, accounting for age issues, et cetera, it doesn't make any difference. There are experts who have really low visual ability. There are experts who have really high visual ability. And their maps are all equally accurate. And they're more accurate than the novices. So what is that about? Visual spatial ability helps our novices. But it doesn't seem to matter for the experts. So what does that mean? It probably means that the experts have circumvented their limits. And the good example for this is, some of y'all can go out in the field with a map, a topo map, and you know where you are, right? How many people do that? You have a topo map, you can look around and you're like, oh, I'm here. Yeah, I don't do that, but I can figure it out pretty easily because I look for some highs and then I rotate my body and I figure it out. It probably takes me five minutes longer than you to figure where I am in the world. But I've circumvented my limits. I don't have the innate ability to just look and see, but I can figure it out. So with enough training, you can figure it out. This phenomenon of circumvention has been identified in several different disciplines. So, but generally things like piano playing, right? Not these complex disciplines like the geosciences. Um, and if you think about it, it turns out that for those spatial tests that we've been using, if you take enough of those tests, you learn how to take the test without using any spatial ability. There are some clues in them that give you, you can figure out how to find out the answers. And, you, and so people actually have shown in studies that those tests, if they're taken too often by someone, are no longer a measure of spatial ability. They're a measure of how much you've figured out what the rules of the test are. Okay? So, well, experts can circumvent any low abilities. So that means that these people who come into the field with low spatial ability, with enough time on task, they can become these people. Just have to figure out how to get around their limitations. Okay? So that take home message would be, it really matters for novices. It doesn't matter so much for experts. And what I would say is, could we figure out what experts are doing to circumvent their limitations if they have low spatial abilities? What are they doing to get around it? And can we teach it to the novices so that the high spatial ability don't have this leg up that we don't know how to help the low spatial ability also gain. Does that make sense? What is it the experts of the low abilities are doing to be able to be successful in the field? So that's the next question. What do you know? So what do experts do differently? And there is one giant take home message about teaching people to map that's going to come out of this last study. Okay. So do experts map differently than novices? The answer is yes. We know they do. And this is expertise as measured by time in the field, how much you know about geology, everything, um, and even how good was your map. What is it that people who are making good maps are doing that's different than people who aren't making such good maps? So in this study, I'm going to just show you a tiny bit these GPS movements. So how do people move through the field? And I'm also going to show you some retrospective interview and retrospective interviews, so some language that people used after they did the study. So we were up from 7 in the morning to like 11 o'clock at night collecting data from people. And after they came back from the field, they either got to eat dinner or they came and sat with us. And we did about an hour-long interview with them to say, show us what you did. And we got information from them about what they were doing. We also had a small handful of people who had audio recorders, and they were talking to them the whole time they were in the field. Okay. Same population of people. So it's the same field study. So this is the map area. And the question is, did people move physically through this area differently if they made good maps or not so good maps? So this is a key to the map area. Again, it's distorted if you know it. This is a key. 
And this is a key that we walked the contact lines for. So this is like as accurate as a map can get, I think. Um, this is the kind of thing an expert did. So a really good mapper. So this is a really good map. It wasn't perfect, right? They only had one day. But it's pretty close. Um, and very few people saw this intrusion. But. And then novices might take something that like, looked like this, where they got some of the features, um, but sometimes they had many more um, layers, or sorry, units and in the area. And um, often they missed the structure. OK, so what are they doing differently? So we cut the population into two halves, again, those people who made maps above the midline and those people who had ma a map accuracy below the midline. And these squiggly lines are the GPS tracks for every single person in that population. So these squiggly lines are 37 GPS tracks, and these squiggly lines are 30 GPS tracks. The darker colors here show the areas where people spent more time. So the experts spent a lot of time in the middle, not a lot of time on the edges. The novices spent kind of almost equal time everywhere except on these edges. So what we see, in fact, if you look at the shape of these tracks, novices and experts are moving through the, through the field in very similar ways. And most of the people that we talked to, we would ask them, why did you move through the field the way you moved? And they would say, oh, I know. I was taught. You have to go to the high point. And someone else would say, I know. I was taught. You have to walk down strike. And someone else would say, I was taught. You have to go up dip. Turns out that none of those things make any difference. All of those strategies work. Experts used all sorts of different strategies. Novices used all sorts of different strategies. There was no relationship between those sorts of strategies and how good your math was. So that's interesting. But experts know where to concentrate their time. Why do they know where to concentrate their time, right? So the experts are really concentrating their time in the places where the contacts are and the structure is really evident in this field area. Novices, not so much. A little bit, but they're not quite getting it. Why? I think maybe we know why. So if we look at their discourse, what is it that novices say that they're doing in the field? I'm just giving you three examples. We have hundreds of these. So novices say things like, I had a hard time finding where I was, or I was trying to find where I was, or I found out where I was. I'm trying to find this place on the map in reality. They also said things like, um, I had to identify rocks in the field, and they didn't look like the lab specimens. Why do we show them lab specimens? I'll never know. But um, it was hard for me to identify the rocks. I had to identify rocks. I had to figure out what I was looking at. And then they would say things like, there are fractures and faults. Right? What am I looking at? So it turns out that novices ask themselves two questions. Where am I? It's good, right? I have a map. I've got to figure out where I am. Now, they're often wrong right? when they're brand new to it. But once they get a little bit of training, they're not bad at figuring out where they are. Okay, Where am I? They also say, what am I looking at? What kind of rock? Is there a fracture? Do I see any structures here? Right? What am I looking at? And then they generate a map. So they make a map. Okay? So there's a map that's made after asking these questions. And they ask a lot of these questions, and they make these maps. They ask a lot of questions. How is that different from experts? Well, it turns out that experts ask these kinds of questions. Um, I'm going to walk up to a high point and look over the map area. I'm going to figure out where I am. They also say things like, I'm going to say this is a dolomite. It's soft. Okay. So what am I looking at? Same as novices. But then they say things like this. Okay. And you can read this. Um, so they're ta this guy's talking about, I think the granite's intrusive. It's parallel to the two fault planes I measured before. So if the granite was synchronous with some kind of regional deformation, it might explain shearing and intermixing of rocks. And as you move through this transcript, he repeatedly comes back to, I think this is what's going on. I might have to refine what I'm talking about. I think this is what's going on. I need more data. So experts ask, where am I and what am I looking at, just like novices. But they also say, what does it mean? What's the underlying processes that can explain the structure? That one quote, he was talking about regional deformation and synchronous shearing. Right? He can, he can explain what's going on. Novices almost never did this. The people who didn't make great maps almost never asked themselves the underlying why. To the novice, this is really cool, the map is the product. You're making a map. 
to the expert, you're not making a map. You're making meaning. You're making a model of what's going on. The map is just a representation of a model. And I don't think we teach this to our students. I don't think we actually, now you guys do, but I don't think in other, you know, across the country, I don't think this is something we really teach. Even more interestingly, while novices, so you notice they were sort of smeared out over how they moved around the map area. Um, like they went to places at equal amounts of time. Novices measured everything once. What am I looking at? Where am I? What am I looking at? Move on to the next place. Where am I what I'm looking at? Experts didn't do that. Experts revisited places. Experts, in fact, said, where am I? What am I looking at? What does it mean? If I'm not so sure what it means, or if what I thought I saw doesn't jive with what I think it means, I better go back and double check myself. So you make maps. Is that what you do? Yeah. The novices don't do that. People who don't make great maps don't actually do that. And in fact, articulated that that would be a bad thing. You're wasting your time if you go back to where you've already been. So after experts do this in this iterative way, then they make a map, which actually has a meaning. It's a model, not just a map. So what's the take home? Experts and novices move really similarly in the field. Like their actual physical motions seem to be dictated by the underlying geology, the topography. What could I, we had one guy who climbed a sheer cliff, but only one guy. Okay, everybody else followed the topography. Um, but the purpose for the map was really different. The novices are making a map. They're turning in the map and then I'm done. The experts are making a model. And I can't express that enough. Okay. Um, so, if we put it all together, what we know is that, yep, if you're a geoscientist, you have slightly higher visual spatial ability than the general public, probably. On average, across the sample, higher. A little bit, a little bit. That's kind of cool. And actually, I like that uh, once you get into the field of geosciences, the gender differences go away. I think it's kind of cool. I think it's also really cool that novices have a leg up for visual ability, but once you gain a certain level of expertise, it doesn't matter anymore. Somehow you work around those limitations. What can we do to help people figure out how to work around the limitation? And then finally, novices only see maps, experts see meaning. And I think that's something that would be really important to teach when we're trying to train people how to do this. So, in conclusion, that's not bad. Um, I have a big lab, and so I need to thank all the people who helped me in my lab. This is actually only some of them. Um, some pieces of the work that you saw were collaborations from a bunch of different uh, institutions. And uh, of course, I have to thank funding and all the people who participated in the research. There may or may not be people here who did. And then um, all the various colleagues that I have. So, free to ask me questions. And I'm really curious, like, that's a very different talk, right? But did it make sense? Oh, good. I wanted to pitch it to, the, to make sense. Was there a That's a really good question. So what we found was that the experts tended to be in the middle. So the amount of time mapping ranged from three hours to nine hours. We got really scared with the nine hour guy. Oh, because there are bears and mountain lions. And they actually all had to sign a consent form that said, if I get eaten by a mountain lion, I'm not going to sue, basically. And we had a bear watcher, we had a guy, and we had a bear in the area. There were lots of cows. Yes. So the, it went from three hours to nine hours. The experts were in the middle, four or five hours of mapping. The novices were the little bit, I don't like this, all the way through the highest end, the most time. I don't know what I'm looking at. Those were the end members. The experts tended to be in the middle. They did, yep. And this made a little difference. So they got a satellite photo. It, it, it did a little bit. So for the one boundary that was really obvious, for the one boundary, we had a lot of people who told, not a lot, a few of the experts who said, I looked at it and I knew what this was. Interestingly, there were some people who made really good maps who had no idea that they were looking at a, at a fold. In, in, from the satellite photo. And there were people who said, oh, I knew it was a fold, and their maps were really bad. So yes, there's that little leg. And we actually had a whole 
uh, pl research planning? Do we give them a topo? Do we give them a salad? Do we give them nothing? Do we give them a map with just some waypoints on it? You know, put some stakes in the field and tell them where they are. What do we do? And we decided to be as authentic as possible. And often people have satellite photos when they're out mapping. So, so yeah. Yes. Yeah, where they go. Yeah, yeah. But I, but I wonder what would happen if you told students, like, I don't know what you do, but if, if we told students, go and look and come up with a hypothesis, draw out a picture of what it is, and then say, does it make sense? No, go back. That's okay. Not a problem. And in fact, if we gave them a full credit for mapping a quarter of the map really, really, really well, Right. What, what would that look like? What does it look like authentically? I don't know who else maps. I just know you do. But authentically, what does it look like when we're making a map? Right. It's interesting. It sort of indicated that the novices with low spatial abilities, as they become experts, mm -hmm. will work around that. Did you test to see if they actually improve? <laughs> um, I could go back, perhaps, to the people who are in the study, because the study, some of the people were in the study like three or four years ago, four years ago. And so I could go back and measure them, but I haven't. So what this is, this is a not a longitudinal study where you follow the same people, but it's a cross-age study where you look at different people and make an assumption that the people who are here in time, when they were back in time at this level, they would have looked the same. So no. But that would be a good study. Capture me some people. I'll put them in a cage. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Well, and, and the hard thing is, is as you age, you'd have to capture people as children and measure their ability. I can say one thing. Um, spatial ability, so there's a huge argument. I have my side of the argument, but there's a huge argument. Um, can, is spatial ability innate? Are you born with it? And maybe a little bit of, a, of a, what happens when you grow up, or are you kind of born with your ability? Um, and can it change or not change? So people agree that most of it you're born with. Right? A lot of our abilities are innate. But some people think you can train people into much better spatial abilities. And you can. I could give you a test, and I could make your spatial ability better. I could give you some tasks to do every day. The question is, how long does it last? If I stop having you do those tasks every day, do you go back to where you were? Or do you stay improved even after stopping the tasks? People have arguments about that. So how much does training change your visual ability? I don't know. That's interesting. Let me hear more about that. Well, you were saying that, you know, experts ask, ask a question about what does this mean? Or what is so, this okay, okay. So that's interesting. So there's another data set that I haven't talked about where we looked at the emotions, the emotional responses that were, their affective responses that were um, conveyed in interviews by all of the people in the study. And what we found was that everybody really wanted to know what was going on. The novices, and, and, and actually, um, there were all sorts of emotions, happiness, sadness, all sorts of stuff. The novices were scared and upset when they faced something they didn't understand. The experts were like, ah, I got this, man. I'm going to figure this out. Exact same problem, two totally different responses, which I think comes from comfort more not so much curiosity but comfort in your own ignorance i don't know a lot of stuff i'm cool with that right whereas we teach our students they must know everything and i think actually that goes back to could we give someone a good grade for mapping a small piece of a map area really really well as opposed to telling them you have to do it all right it's an interesting question does that yeah You mean expertise as mappers or expertise as geoscientists? Yeah. Oh, become gaining visual spatial expertise? <laughs> so, yeah, so that's interesting. So, um, there are people who leave the field, uh, STEM, science and engineering, 
they leave because of poor quantitative skills, probably poor visuospatial skills. I, I think that's sort of sideways measured. Um, other skills like poor writing skills, things like that. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever read I'm Not Dumb, I'm Different. I'm Not Dumb, I'm Different is a study of why people leave science. And that's actually a quite interesting book. Um, a side piece of what you talked about, though, um, the visuospatial differences between the novices who had low visual ability and the novices who had high visual ability, it was a really small difference. Okay? It was different, but it was not all of visual ability. They were all higher than the general public. There's actually work that's being done where people want to, and I think they are, measure the visual spatial ability of budding engineers, take the people who have low ability and say, go do something else. And fundamentally, I don't like that. Because I see it, I understand it, because gosh, if you weed out the people who come in with a disadvantage, then you're gonna have just really good people in the field, right? But aren't you losing diversity when you're doing that? And isn't diversity of value? And there's all sorts of other wrinkly issues about being able to take a test and what that means, you know, so. Does that answer your question? I, I, there is, yeah, sort of, yeah. But read, they're not dumb, they're different. Yeah. Little bit. So there's people who are studying that. It, so again, it's not clear. People have studied visual abilities for like 100 years. It's not completely clear what matters because is a child who plays with Legos, like my son, I have a nine-year-old, loves them, huge spatial abilities, okay? I can see this in all sorts of things that he does. Are his spatial abilities high because he plays with Legos? Or does he like playing with Legos because he already has high spatial ability? If you take a child and you force them to draw pictures, yeah, you might make them a better artist, force them to play the piano, Right? You'll make them a better piano player. Are they going to play the piano when they grow up? Maybe not. And so it's, it's an interesting, how do you separate the chicken from the egg? What comes first, the enjoyment of it or the underlying skill? Right. Or the doing of it and the underlying skill? So people are studying that. Not me, though. I assume because you use the free test, mm -hmm. the better test measure. Um, um, they are, yeah, so they are measures of spatial abilities. So these were ETS tests, Educational Testing Service tests. They've been around for 40 years now. Very well vetted, very well understood. There are more recent tests, like there's a test out of Purdue, a rotations test. Um, there is a, people talk about visual penetrative ability. I'm not sure that exists, but people talk about it. Um, you know, ability to see what's happening in the subsurface based on disconnected pieces of information. Um, there's a test of that. Um, but those are less well vetted. So what we chose to do was to use tests that were unambiguously going to be accepted by the most stringent researchers. Yeah, well, you can ask them interviews and they tell you how they solved it. It's not spatial. Yeah. Is there any discussion about the actual where they're actually the tools Not on these spatial tests. So these spatial tests are uh, domain general, which means that you can give them to anybody in any discipline. You don't have to have any specific disciplinary knowledge. And so, It, it, it may be, it, it, you know, it may be that even on the spatial test, they're working around those limitations. I mean, that is a possible explanation for architects and organic chemists, et cetera, do better on these tests. I would say that the people who are the psychologists who study this stuff would argue that that's probably not true, in that they measure enough people, um, like organic chemists who do all sorts of kinds of things, and they all score a little bit higher, right? Oh. Oh. They're doing some sort of work around in general. So the only argument against that would be if you take people in geosciences in any subfield, seismologists who only write code, they still do better on their spatial ability. 
So they haven't immersed themselves. Chemists do better on their spatial ability. Organic chemists do way better. And so it might be in some subfields they're, they're gaining some skill for working around tasks that require something spatial. But in general, across field, across the field, people in these fields do better, even if they're not engaging in spatial tasks on a daily basis. Oh, okay. Then what are you talking about? What test? Oh, oh, okay, I'm sorry. So there's a mapping ability. Oh, that's right. Yes. 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 Right. I gotcha. So I think that that's probably true. Okay, I understand. So what he what he's saying is that their ability to make the map is just because they saw something once and they're like, I know where it goes because I've done this a million times. Right. So it turns out with this, you can only do that with one of the contacts. Maybe a second contact is really, really good. But your uh, map accuracy, if you just do that, because we had people just do that. They sketched it out on the satellite photo, and that dictated their whole map, and it wasn't very accurate. It was middle-level accurate, not low-level, not high-level. And so when we talk about the very high-level accurate people, they're not just using their experience to tell them what it should look like. They're actually engaging in mapping. Okay, so we're on the same page? Awesome. Yeah, okay. Those were all um, from interviews except for one. So the responses I got, um, this one. So this was audio. This was, the rest of them were interviews actually. This one was from an audio log. So he's explaining or she's explaining, I'm gonna call this a dolomite, it's definitely soft. So he's talking or she's talking while she's engaging in the tests, right? From the audio logs. Um, that there's an awful lot of where am I and what am I looking at on the part of everybody. And the, well, so um, have you guys heard of the multiple working hypothesis theory that geoscientists and other people, but geoscientists, when they're out in the field or engaged, in, but often in the field, they have multiple working hypotheses and they have two or three models and they're collecting data and they're refining their hypotheses and discarding hypotheses and building. Yeah, we don't do that. That's not true. We don't do that. What people do do, it depends on what you do. Some experts who make very good maps go in and say, collect a little data and go, I think this is a model. They might collect some more data that, that goes against their model and they go, that goes against my model and I know it. I'm going to put it over here and that goes against my model. Uh, uh, but I only have a certain amount of time. So I'm going to stick with this model until I find enough data to make me reject it. Um, anecdotally, I think those are people who have to make maps for a living in a short period of time, right? So I know some environmental geoscientists who have to make maps in a very short period of time. Okay. Other people go in not with multiple working hypotheses. They go in, they collect data, and they say, I think this is what it means, like this. And then they go collect more data. And if the data contradicts their model, they change the model. They don't have multiple models at once. They have models over time that are multiple, but not at the same time. We didn't see anybody do that. It could be. A fold. We did have a few people go, well, I see something that looks like it could be a fault. Maybe it's a fold. I think it's a fault. That was about as deep as it went. It didn't go any deeper than that. So the multiple working hypotheses isn't quite, I think, what we've had people hypothesize it looks like. So. Oh, let's go ahead. Oh, it's fine. Yes. That's right. That's right. Making a prediction. They're looking at what they see and they say, I predict that hypothesis is correct. I'm going to find something. That's right. Or, so not everybody predicted. Some people said, here's my model. I don't know what I'm going to see. I'm just going to go see. Here's what I find. Does it fit my model? Yeah. Okay, I'll move on. It doesn't fit my model, I gotta change my model. So not every person who made a great map actually made a prediction. They just said, here's the model, I'm gonna collect more data to test the model. So rather than the predictive process, they were doing a testing process, which is also authentic for science. So, but it's still a process. <laughs> yeah. Uh 
So there are people, you mean increase your visual spatial ability? So there are people who are working on this. You can talk to Carol Ormond at Carleton College, I think. She's working on it, right? Um, but I don't think it sticks. So I, I just don't believe, it. there's a review paper that came out, David Utah at Northwestern just published it. And he says spatial ability is malleable. He looked at a whole bunch of studies and you can change spatial ability. All of those studies show that spatial ability could be changed over the period of a few weeks, maybe a month. I want to know years from now, if I train a novice in spatial ability, is it going to make any different years from now, right? Otherwise, shouldn't we be training novices to work around the limitation? What is it that experts do? Like, for instance, do we really teach people how to locate themselves in the field? I mean, I know I did a field, I did Lehigh's field camp, and they didn't teach me how to find myself in the field. I had to figure it out. Right, because they knew how to find themselves in the field. They looked at the map and they knew where they were. <laughs> Nobody told me how to do it. I had to get it over time, right? And so what are those very fundamental, simple field skills that we just kind of know how to do that we can maybe like hypothesizing or testing that we know to do, but maybe we don't make explicit to our students? And ask them to find evidence. Oh. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. Oh, that's interesting. So you only have one thing to do instead of multiple things. Yeah. No, I mean, you didn't have to figure out what it was. Yeah. They told you. Yeah. And actually, when we took these people in the field, we gave them a crash course of the geology <laughs> before we had the map. Yep. Right. Well. Right. Right. So I would say, so we ask people about where they went to field camp. I'm not going to like tell anybody about it, but there were huge differences between where people went to field camp, what the field camp looked like, because everybody in the study had done field mapping. They had gone to a field camp and or they had participated in a field mapping project. Okay? The different field camps are really varied in what they do. Indiana is a shining beacon that are, that does, and wouldn't it be great if everybody could go to an Indiana? Right. I teach field geology, but also subsurface. Oh yes, yes, same thing. So, you know, we're not doing, we're not trying to. I guess I, I, what I've learned here is I don't necessarily have to teach spatial ability. Mm -mm. No, but you teach techniques that where they can apply some of it, where they learn methods, and I think that's the to get them over the frustration. They learn a heuristic, which is a rule for how to figure it out. So I um, worked for an oil company for a summer. You know, everybody, a lot of people do that. So I did my oil company summer, and I did 3D seismic, because I, I was a geophysicist. And it was not, it was the least intellectual thing I ever did, because in the first week, I figured out, OK, that's an anticline, and that's a syncline, and that's a fault, and there's pretty colors. It was like simple. Once I knew the rule, I actually didn't have to understand anything spatial. That's an anticline, that's a syncline, that's a fault. And there's a suite of them, but it wasn't hard at all. Um, and the guy I was working with taught me this stuff. And then I spent the whole summer you know, doing well logs and matching them up and doing it. But there was no limit. To, my spatial abilities aren't fabulous. It didn't make a difference. I could interpret once I was taught the tricks. I mean, it wasn't that simple, right? There's more complicated structures. But, um, and actually, it's funny. I feel like I can interpret 3D seismic or 2D seismic. That that is something that I can do. I'd have to think again. Don't ask me. <laughs> but I could do that, right, with a little refresher. I don't know that I can make a map. And I think it might be because of the way I was trained, right? I was given rules about how to do seismic. I just pull out my old notebooks, open them up. I'm not the best, but I'm not bad, right? So I have a question. How many of you guys teach block diagrams? in your entry level. So that's, that's almost all intro. You guys don't, do you guys have an intro geology kind of course? Does that have block diagrams in it? 
Okay. <laughs> well, I have a question about that, though, right? So what I find fascinating about block diagrams is that is a visualization. I don't know who made it up. Someone made it up at some point, kind of for themselves or to teach something. I don't, does anybody except for the most uber mapper ever use a block diagram? You do palimpsestic reconstructions. You might do cross sections, but do you actually use block diagrams? I don't. I don't. You do, but you're you're the uber mapper, right? So the question is for the intro, why block diagrams? What's the skill you're teaching? It's an interesting question because those are something that visuospatial skill super impacts. Give your students, give your students a visuospatial test. And a block diagram, and the block, and then the block diagram stuff. See how they do in the block diagrams, and map it against visual spatial skill. I bet there'll be a, be a nice correlation between that. Oh, and you saw a correlation. I don't no. know yet. I've okay. Okay. <laughs> anyway. Did you understand it? Uber stand it?